Let me, first of all, welcome the initiative that was taken by the University of Hohenheim Department of Gender and Nutrition, FIAN, um, and the International Baby Food Action Network and the Geneva Infant Feeding Association to organize this workshop at this very important summit on nutrition held in Rio de Janeiro. To me, it is absolutely vital that we re-establish the gender issue and the issue of human rights at the very center of our efforts to combat child malnutrition and unhealthy diets leading to overweight and obesity in adult life. These are extremely essential dimensions of the strategies that we must pursue to combat child malnutrition and overweight and obesity, but they are often neglected because many policymakers do not understand the benefits that they can um, achieve by using human rights and gender rights uh, better in these strategies. Many governments today are facing increasingly what we call a dual burden. First of all, we have still extremely high rates of child malnutrition in many parts of the developing world. Today, it is estimated that about one third of the deaths of children below five years of age can be attributable to undernutrition. And this represents 3.1 million deaths each year. 34% of children in developing countries, a total of 186 million children, are today suffering from stunting, a low height for age, and the percentages are even higher in Sub-Saharan Africa, 42%, and in South Asia, where 48% of children are um, affected by, by stunting, the most common indicator for chronic malnutrition of children. In 10% of the cases, children under 5 are wasted. They have a weight that is too low for their height. And this is the result of acute malnourishment affecting immunity to diseases, affecting um, uh, the possibility for children to resist certain diseases so that these children have nine times more uh, risks of dying than well-nourished children. At the same time, we have an increasingly worrying phenomenon, which is that in adult life, um, uh, people develop uh, overweight and obesity uh, that has very significant public health impacts. I was struck by this in my missions done in China, in South Africa, Mexico, uh, Brazil in particular. In China, uh, as many children today are overweight and obese than are undernourished. And basically it is estimated that the costs of obesity in China will represent 8% of the GDP in that country by 2025. In South Africa, 29% of the men and 56% of women are overweight or obese. In Mexico, 70% of the adult population are overweight um, or obese and they will have, on average, 18 years of their life spent in medical treatment for this, for this reason. In Brazil, 50% of the population is considered to be overweight and 15% obese. In fact, although I mentioned these emerging economies, overweight and obesity are not simply limited to these emerging economies. Of course, in the OECD, 19 out of 24 countries have more than 50% of their population that is overweight or obese. And on a worldwide basis today, overweight and obesity affects 1.3 billion people, more even than people who are insufficiently uh, nourished. And this leads to non-communicable diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, certain types of cancers developing as a result of these unhealthy diets. Now, the gender and human rights dimensions are absolutely vital, in my view, in addressing these challenges, and this is why this workshop is so important. I see the role of gender rights, uh, women's rights and human rights important for four reasons. Uh, first of all, the promotion of breastfeeding during the first two years of the child's life and exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months is absolutely vital, both for the child's physical and mental development uh, as demonstrated by the study of Victoria and others in the Lancet series of um, 2008 uh, uh, that contained a set of articles on child malnutrition and maternal malnutrition, um, showing that the thousand first days uh, between conception and the second birthday of the child are absolutely vital 
um, for the future development of the child. And yet, we still have a situation in which violations of the 1981 International Code on the Marketing of Breast Milk, su breast milk Substitutes uh, are very frequent. In fact, the World Health Organization has uh, documented that the International Code on the Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes has been implemented in 103 countries by regulation, but in only 50% of these cases are there adequate compliance um, monitoring mechanisms. And in fact, only 37 countries of these 103 countries have in place adequate monitoring and enforcement mechanisms that can combat violations of the code. So breastfeeding is hugely important, but violations of this code that seeks to support it are very widespread still. In addition, very often breastfeeding is incompatible with women's employment as a result of a lack of accommodation measures in the workplace. And this too is something that governments should address more in the future. A second reason why women's rights and human rights are important to combating child malnutrition and um, unhealthy diets is that social protection interventions, such as cash transfer programs, are particularly effective when they benefit women as a matter of priority. I could see firsthand, for example, the effectiveness of the Oportunidades program in Mexico. Uh, this has been the new name given to the Progresa program initially um, uh, inaugurated in 1997 in Mexico. Oportunidades is a conditional cash transfer program that covers today some 6 million households in Mexico protecting 9.6% of the population from falling below poverty line. It is absolutely essential um, in, in Mexico, the function that this program fulfills, and it is a program that is directed towards women as a matter of priority. Similarly, this is what the Bolsa Familia program has done in Brazil, and this is what the Child Support Grant in South Africa aims to achieve. It has been shown by studies that women's um, ability to make choices about how the household budget shall be spent has significant benefits for the food security of the household and particularly for the children's health, education and nutrition needs. A child's chances of survival, it has been estimated, increase by 20% when the mother controls the family budget. So for this second reason too, focusing on women's rights, on empowerment of women within households, on choices being made by women as to how to spend the family budget are absolutely vital in improving the nutritional condition of children. Thirdly, framing the question of undernutrition and of malnutrition in human rights terms leads to emphasize the dimensions of accountability and the duties of governments to take action against insufficient or inadequate uh, nutrition. In many cases, governments make promises that they will address these issues seriously. But in many cases, the promises that are made are not kept. And we need to improve accountability of governments in monitoring the implementation of the action plans that they adopt. It is, in my view, the role of civil society organizations to hold governments to account and to ensure that the promises do not, um, are not forgotten. It is also the role of legislation to be adopted by parliaments to define the benefits as rights um, that individuals uh, may claim before independent bodies and to reduce the risk of discrimination by having a human rights approach to social protection programs. Fourth and finally, the reason why human rights and women's rights matter to combating undernutrition and inadequate nutrition is because the right to adequate food also requires that we opt for solutions that can, get, that can have a lasting impact on um, reducing food insecurity by empowering local people and by identifying solutions that will be sustainable in the long term. Um, we must move, in my view, from supply-driven solutions to combating child malnutrition and inadequate diets to demand-driven solutions that come from the, 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 the demands uh, of the people who are victims of violations of the right to food. And that means, in particular, identifying the linkages 
between nutrition interventions focused on the short-term imperative of saving lives and the long-term poverty reduction and development um, strategies that must be pursued. For this reason, we must support increasingly local agri-food systems in their ability to provide local populations with um, um, a large uh, number of uh, food products, uh, varied diets that can respond to the nutritional needs of the people, and we must invest in local producers to provide the food that these communities require for um, their ability to lead healthy and active lives. And I believe that nutrition interventions should be um, based on local systems um, improving their functioning, should invest on local production, and should link local producers to local consumers as a means to achieve um, adequate diets in a way that is sustainable and that is not dependent on external interventions. So for all these reasons, I would like again to welcome very warmly the initiative of the University of Ohenheim Department of Gender and Nutrition, FIAN, the uh, Geneva Infant Feeding Association and IPFAN that have sought to bring this message forward in Rio de Janeiro that women's rights and human rights are absolutely key to succeed in strategies to reduce food insecurity and child malnutrition in particular. And with this, I would like to thank you and wish you all a very productive um, uh, working session.